Hello, thanks for inviting me to this um, seminar. Um, and I'm going to tell you um, about long alternating paths and I will show you that they exist. And uh, this is joint work with Pavel Weiter from uh, Kais University in Prague. So um, first let me explain to you what the problem is. Uh, what is an alternating path and what is a long alternating path? Um, we are given in this problem two endpoints in the plane. They are in convex position and um, exactly half of these two endpoints are red and uh, the other half of these two endpoints are blue. So for example here we have an input of um, 12 points, uh, six of them are red and six of them are blue and they are in convex position. And what we want is we want to find an alternating non-crossing path on this uh, point set and uh, what does this mean? So alternating means that the path um, has to alternate between red and blue points. So um, it has to visit the points and has to switch between red and blue. Every point, of course, because the path should be used at most once and there should be no crossings in the path. So two edges of the path should not cross or should not uh, intersect unless if they um, have a common endpoint. And um, so let's see a few examples so that we understand the definition. So here we see a path on the point set, but it's not an alternating path because um, here we connected to blue points, um, which is not allowed. Then um, here we have a path which is alternating because it switches between red and blue um, points, but it is not non-crossing because here we have some edges which cross. And here we have a path that um, fulfills all the criteria of the definition it's alternating, it alternates between red and blue, it's non-crossing, um, and it is a path. And um, so now that we have this definition, of course, there are several algorithmic questions that one might ask. And um, so the first question is, if we are given a set of two endpoints uh, in convex position in the plane with the property, property that n of them are red and n of them are blue, uh, find a longest alternating path, so an alternating path with the maximum number of vertices or points. And so this is a typical algorithmic question that one might ask. And it turns out, if you think about it for a little bit, this question is actually um, algorithmically easy. So it's a simple exercise in dynamic programming to find um, such a path. So you can write down a dynamic program that uh, can uh, solve this in uh, n cube time quite easily. And uh, I think it can also be improved to n squared if you try a little bit harder. Um, so, but this question now is not so interesting from a research point of view, um, but uh, of course you can also ask other questions. And um, the question that we would like to look at in this talk is the combinatorial question. So um, we want to know um, for any given uh, n, what is the longest alternating path? What is the length of the longest alternating path that uh, we can find as a function of n um, worst case over all colorings. So um, the question is, uh, given any two n points in convex position, n red and n blue, what is um, the, um, the um, best uh, alternating path? Um, what is the minimum length of a longest alternating path that you can find over all possible colorings of these two n points, such that n points are red and n points are blue? Okay, and so this question now turns out to be much more interesting than the algorithmic question and it has been looked at for um, maybe it's been more than 30 years now. Um, the first person to propose this question was Erdos. Well actually I should say that um, this question was discovered in several contexts um, before. So in the context of computational biology, of protein folding, of stringology, um, uh, looking at properties of palindromic words. Um, but uh, um, we here make uh, 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 work in geometry. So um, I look at the variant uh, that was posed by Erdős in the 1980s. And um, Paul Erdős uh, also showed something. Um, he showed that actually one can uh, say something um, interesting about this, um, about this uh, length of the, um, um, of the longest alternating path, worst case over all colorings. Uh, and he showed that actually um, one can always find a pretty long um, um, alternating path um, as follows with the following easy argument. So uh, all we need to do is we take a halving line for this um, point set, an arbitrary halving line. So this is just a line 
um, such that we have n points to the left and n points to the right of it. So here um, I picked a line um, like this where we have six points to the left and six points to the right, um, but it doesn't really matter which halving line um, I pick, any one will do. And uh, now what can we observe with this halving line? So since we have n red points uh, in total, um, so uh, on um, one side of the halving line, there have to be at least n over two red points. So at least half of the red points have to be on one side of the halving line. In this example, um, we have um, um, four red points, which is more than half of the red points to the left of the halving line. And now um, we can conclude because the number of red points and the number of blue points is the same. And because I picked the halving line, that on the other side um, of the halving line, there have to be at least n over two blue points. Um, like that, because there can be at most n over two red points on the other side. So they have to be at least n over two because um, we have um, n points there. And now, um, since I have this halving line and I have the number of points uh, on each side, I can just uh, connect the points in a zigzag fashion. And this will not be crossing because the halving line guarantees uh, that um, that we can uh, we, we, we can impose an order on the segments. And, um, and uh, then we get an alternating path. And this alternating path uses n points, like this. And uh, so we have shown that uh, this function uh, i at n it will always be at least n for any n because um, uh, no matter what the coloring is, I can always find um, an alternating path of length at least n. And um, so this is an easy lower bound. And um, since this question is um, quite easy uh, to, to state and uh, uh, quite easy to understand, um, uh, of course, many people uh, have worked on it and tried to improve this. And um, so there also have been some improvements to this lower bound. And um, um, so for this, uh, we need to introduce a new notion. And this is the notion of a run. And um, a run um, is quite intuitive. So it's just um, a maximal sequence of consecutive points of the same color. Um, so for example, here, um, this would be a run because it's a maximal sequence of red points. So that would be a red run. This would be a blue run, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. And here in this example, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 runs. And um, so it was observed um, by several people that um, the number of runs um, can be used to um, get better lower bounds than the simple um, n lower bound that was given by Erdős. And so the first result in this direction is due to a Kinchel, Pach and Toth from uh, 2008. Um, and uh, they showed that um, if you have many runs, then actually you can find um, a long alternating path. And more precisely, they showed the following bound that um, this function alt n is always at least n plus the number of runs divided by 2 minus 1. So for example, um, if uh, we have the maximum number of runs and the maximum number of runs is achieved if the point set um, um, alternates between red and blue, so I have alternating red and blue points, then I have uh, two n runs, then uh, the lower bound of uh, Kinship, Pach and Toth would say that in this case, alt n, um, or in this case, the, the, the length of the um, longest um, alternating path is at least, um, is at least um, um, uh, uh, 2n minus 1. Uh, which is uh, maybe off by one, but uh, pretty close. And um, so this is uh, uh, um, uh, one lower bound in terms of uh, uh, the runs. The uh, second lower bound is due to uh, Viola uh, Mesa Roche uh, from her PhD thesis. And uh, it's also improving um, some argument that was uh, in this paper by Kinchel, Park and Toth. And uh, this tells basically um, also if you do not, if you have few runs, so if the number of runs is small, then you also get some improvement, right? So for example, if um, you have a point set, so you have all the red points on one side and all the blue points on the other side, then you would also expect that you have a long alternating path. And um, so that shows also if you have, if you do not have many runs, but few runs, then you also get an improvement. And that basically says you get something like n plus n divided by k, right? So um, I mean, plus, uh, and then there's some additive terms, but basically, um, if you have uh, just, uh, I mean, two runs, um, then you get um, also some improvement.
But I mean, this uh, is a this bound is not so tight um, because if you had just two runs, you might expect an alternating path of length um, um, two n. But uh, here you would only get three halves of n. And then of course, um, so this is, it really depends on the number of runs these two theorems. But you can put them together, right? So there's a trade-off. So this is good if you have many runs. This is good if you have few runs. And then you can try to see what is the uh, what is the trade-off. And then, of course, you can. Um, so the trade-off. I mean, the worst case then would be that if you have um, if the number of runs is something like square root of n, and uh, then you can basically show that uh, there will always be an um, alternating path of length n plus uh, omega of square root of n. Right. Um, so you can get some improvement over the um, bound by Erdős, but this is only in the lower order term. Um, so you only get a lower order improvement of root n, um, but um, uh, still here this n. Uh, states. And um, of course, then you have the question, so um, is this really, is this n really um, tight? So can you really get some um, improvement in this constant or is this um, are there colorings where you cannot um, get an alternating path that is substantially longer than n? And this is basically our result. And so this is what I mean by a long alternating path. So Pavel Walter and I show that um, there exists some fixed constant epsilon such that um, no matter what the coloring is, um, you always find a long alternating path of length one plus epsilon times n. And now, of course, uh, the obvious question is, what is this epsilon? <laughs> and um, so, yeah, um, I mean, I'm too embarrassed to say. So this uh, epsilon in our proof is uh, very, very small. We did not really try to, to optimize it, but um, I mean, it would be something like uh, 10 to the minus 100 or something like this, at least the way we wrote it. But of course, um, uh, one can try to optimize it if you want. But so at least the point is that um, it's um, really we can we can improve um, the the leading um, constant of the n, and it's not linear but something super linear. Um, yeah. What is the best upper bound? That you had? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, okay, so this this comes on the next slide. So I will talk about this, and I will also give you an example about the upper bounds. And um, so maybe some remarks. Um, so I mean, our result is a bit more general. I mean, you can of of course have have different um, different variants of this question. I mean, so we um, looked at these alternating paths, but I mean, there's uh, some related questions where you look for matchings um, that uh, that are, um, connect points of different uh, colors that are non-crossing, and you can also ask about matchings that connect points uh, of the same color. So for example, you could ask for uh, maximum uh, monochromatic matching that is non-crossing where you want to connect pairs of points that have the same color and you want to know what the maximum um, size of size, such a matching is. And um, so all I wanted to say with these remarks is that there's also several variants of this question that you can ask and also our lower bounds also apply for these variants of the questions that have motivations from computational biology or stringology or uh, whatnot. Um, Okay, but maybe um, more interestingly, let's talk about upper bounds. Um, so um, since this is, um, I have a bit more time, I wanted to also to spend some time um, uh, talking about upper bounds, at least uh, explain to you one upper bound so that you have some idea why um, the problem is not super trivial. And um, so again, um, as I said, Erdos studied this problem in the 1980s and he did not only prove this um, N lower bound, but he also gave some upper bound and so he said that uh, he showed that uh, um, there exists a coloring. So for every n, or let's say for infinitely many n's, there exists a coloring um, such that um, you cannot find an alternating path of length longer than 1.5 or 3 halves uh, times n plus 2. Yes, so um, Erdos already showed so it cannot be 2n, so you cannot uh, expect to collect all the points, and um, you also cannot. Uh, um, um, expect to find some asymptotically close um, covering of all the points, but there will be colorings where you have to at least um, omit uh, one quarter of all the points um, in your input. And uh, let's see how this coloring looks like. So here is the example. Um, so what uh, do I have? So this is a general example. So we have n. Uh, so we have two n points, and um, so they are arranged like this. So we have a long interval um, of blue points. And so this will be um, 3 quarter n blue points. And on the other side, we have um, 1 quarter n blue points. And um, 
And then the red points, we have one half n red points to the left and one half n red points to the right. So, um, I mean, I didn't draw the points that were schematically, but I guess everybody uh, understands what it means. And, um, and so Erdos claimed that um, this coloring, um, so you cannot find an alternating path of lengths longer than one quarter, uh, 1.5 times n plus two. And so the argument is uh, not so complicated, so uh, I can sketch it for you if you like. So let's see um, why can't you do more, uh, why can't you do more than 1.5 n plus two? So let's assume that uh, um, in this uh, example, I can find an alternating path of lengths longer than 1.5 n plus two. And so since um, I have more than 1.5 n plus two um, points in my alternating path, um, I can conclude that I have also strictly more than uh, 0.75 n blue points, right? So because, I mean, they, they alternate, maybe the first and the last point is uh, red, but still, if I have strictly more than 1.5 n plus two points, I need to have uh, strictly more than um, 0 0.75 n blue points. So if I have some long alternating path that is longer than that bound, um, it has to use uh, a blue point uh, from up here and a blue point from down here. And at some point, the path has to switch. So at some point, um, if I have some long pass, it has to have, um, I mean, two edges that look like this, right? So I have some, uh, it uses some point up here. And then um, after that, it has to use a red point, maybe on this side or maybe on that side. And let's say without loss of generality, because it's uh, symmetric, uh, it's on this side. And then it has to use a blue point from down here, right? So I have to find such a configuration in my pass, uh, two consecutive edges like this. And then, um, and then the path continues somewhere here and continues somewhere there. And now there's four cases. I mean, because the path has to be non-crossing, basically there's four cases. I mean, this path up here, it can continue here in that region or in that region and the path down there, it can conti continue in this region or in that region. And now uh, I have uh, four different cases and I can look at all these cases and see how many, um, how, how long uh, the alternating path can get. And so let's go through all the cases. Um, and so this is not so complicated. Um, so let's assume that uh, the, the paths, they continue both in this region, but then I win because in this region, so these paths, they can collect at most um, 0.5 and red points. And then if uh, there's at most 0.5 and red points, then the total length of the path can be at most something like N plus maybe some small constant. So of course, so the two paths cannot, so the two sub paths, they cannot uh, continue like this. Then um, the same, situation happens if the two subpaths would continue over here. Then again, here I only have uh, 0 0.5 and red points um, available. So these two, um, so the prefix and the suffix um, can only collect at most uh, 0 0.5 and red points in total. And then, so the total length of the path can again be at most um, n plus some constant maybe. Okay, then let's see um, what uh, if uh, I, my path one, so one part of the path continues here and the other part of the path continues there. What happens then? Well, then down here, um, no matter, I mean, so this edge, it goes between this interval and that interval. So, um, but no matter where this edge is, I know that this part of the path, it can collect at most 0 0.5 and blue points, right? Because down here, I only have 0 0.5 and blue points available. And so this part of the path cannot reach any blue points up here. So here I can have at most 0 0.5 and blue points. And um, similarly, this part of the path, it can collect at most um, 0 0.5 and red points because um, it cannot reach any red points over there, right? And so this means that um, in total, I can have, uh, so this path here can have most uh, lengths at most um, n, right? Because it can have at most 0 0.5 and red points and then alternating blue points. And this part of the path uh, can have at most uh, lengths um, 0.5 n because it can have at most 0 0.5 and blue points and then it can be at most double this length. And so we get 1.5 N, right? And so there's this situation and then this situation remains to analyze. And there we have to um, see, um, then we have to look at this path and see how it continues. Uh, definitely it has to go to this red um, interval. And then again, there's two sub cases to check whether we are up here, but in this case um, we have at most 0 0.5 and uh, blue points up here for these two sub paths together. So we have at most 1.5 N and if you go down there, then here we have at most 0 0.5 and blue points that we can collect here and at most 0 0.5 and red points that we can collect here again at most 1.5 n. And that's it. I mean, it's not so, um, not so complicated, a somewhat longish case analysis, but you get the result, right? 
And so this is the um, result by Erdosh. And actually, Erdosh conjectured that this is tight, that the answer will be 1.5n. Um, so it is always possible to find an alternating path of uh, length 1.5n. Um, but this conjecture was disproved by several people independently from each other. And um, so uh, they gave some more sophisticated constructions showing that um, the best upper bound, um, so that uh, there's um, some colorings where the best um, alternating path has length 0 0.133n. So, and I mean, there's a whole family of these constructions. Um, and uh, just this year, um, so there was some paper on the archive where they claimed an, another improvement uh, where they actually reduced this constant further to 1.17n. And I think at some point they also claimed they had a proof that the upper bound is uh, uh, n. Um, but uh, I hope that this proof, uh, I mean, this proof that never materialized hope uh, and I'm glad that it did because otherwise it did not because otherwise it would contradict our result. But, uh, but this paper has not been reviewed yet. So, um, I mean, it's on the archive, you can read it, but um, I did not check the details yet. Um, but so this um, is the best uh, claimed uh, upper bound. And so we don't, uh, I mean, so, so far it was somewhat tempting to conjecture there's some nice constant here maybe 1.5n or maybe, so maybe three halves or maybe four thirds, but now this uh, seems to be ugly. And so we don't know what, what the answer would be. Uh, we think, so it's not one, it's not um, something nice maybe, or maybe it might be, um, I don't know, um, 11 over 10 or something like this. So we don't know. Okay, so this is the background. And um, now in the remaining time, then I would give you some ideas of how our proof works. I mean. Uh, depending on how much time we have and how interested you are, we can go into more details or less details. I mean, I have some cartoon version of the proof that's supposed to give you some idea of uh, how the ideas work. Uh, but um, I mean, the actual proof is quite technical because um, it uh, somehow uses uh, a lot of uh, epsilon management and um, a lot of Markov inequalities and so on. Um, and um, I'm not sure maybe there's some much nicer or more elegant proof um, to be found. Um, but at least that's something that gets the job done uh, for now. Um, and maybe a motivation to look for some nicer argument. Um, okay, but so now let me try to um, explain a little bit of how, how we solve this um, or how we get our um, um, lower bound of a constant as larger than one. So first of all, um, I have to explain our proof. So there's um, a notion of chunks that we use. And so what is a chunk? Um, so we have some, so here uh, you see this, um, again, our convex point set, bicolored, red and blue, and red points and blue points. And I have some number k, and I define a k chunk. k is a natural number. And the k chunk is just a, a consecutive um, sequence of points along this um, um, point set. And um, a k chunk is just a set of, uh, a sequence of points consecutive such, I have, such that I have k points of one color and less, k of, uh, and less than k points of the other color. So for example, this would be a two chunk because uh, it's a consecutive interval and I have uh, two red points and one blue point consecutive. So that's, I would call a two chunk and I call it a red two chunk because the majority color, so the color that has the k points is red and the minority color, the color that has less than uh, two points. So in this example, one point would be um, blue and here, this uh, is also a chunk. This would be uh, also a two chunk because um, um, I have two blue points and one red point. And this I call a blue two chunk because I have two blue points and one red point. So the majority color, the color that achieves um, K is blue and the other one is red. And then here again, I have a red two chunk um, because here I have two red points and uh, one blue point. And here I have a blue two chunk because it's two blue points and one red point. And now what I did is uh, I partitioned my whole point set uh, into chunks. And if I can do that, I call that a configuration. Yeah, a configuration of the point set, a K configuration is a, a partition of the point set into K chunks. And uh, this does not always have to exist. So maybe it's not always possible to um, partition my um, point set into K chunks, but this is, uh, let's pretend that it is um, because it's somehow not really, um, um, not really a problem that um, sometimes it can happen if you try to partition your points into chunks, it may happen that some points uh, are left over that you cannot put into a chunk, but this will not be so many points so you can somehow ignore them. Um, I mean, so that's why we can sometimes always pretend that we can uh, have, that we can find some K configuration for our point set, even though it's uh, technically not true. Um, 
So this um, here would be a two configuration um, in the example down here because I partitioned my points into two chunks. And uh, now to um, further um, and pieces of your vocabulary for these uh, configurations and for chunks, I define something which is called the index of a chunk. And the index of a chunk is just um, the fraction um, of the minority color. I mean, what, what, what is the fraction of the points in the minority color in the, um, as compared to the majority color? So um, if I have a chunk, I know in the majority color, I have uh, K points. Usually I always have K points of the majority color. So in every chunk, I, um, in the K chunk, I have K points of the majority color. In the red chunk, I have, uh, in the red K chunk, I have K red points. In the blue K chunk, I have uh, um, K blue points. But then I don't know how many points I have in the minority color. It can be any number between zero and K minus one. And the index is supposed to quantify this. So the index is supposed to say, um, um, what is the fraction of the points in the minority color in, um, uh, as compared to the majority color? So this, this for example, would be a, a one over two chunk. I mean, no, sorry, here the index would be one over two because I have one blue point and two red points. And here again, also the index would be one over two. So this example I drew here is not so exciting because uh, all the chunks have index one over two, but um, of course um, the indices can vary um, in a configuration quite a lot. Um, and uh, then I can define the index for a configuration and the index uh, of a configuration is just the average index over all chunks, right? So I can somehow say, I can somehow, um, if I have a configuration, I can measure how, um, how diverse it is by saying, so if I look at the chunks, uh, are the chunks um, just uh, barely um, of the majority color or are they, do they have a strong majority and uh, the minority color is somehow um, barely existent. And uh, to, to somehow quantify this, I just define an index um, of the configuration, which is just the average over all chunks. So here, um, the index of this uh, two configuration would be one half because all of the chunks have uh, index one half, but uh, it might be something else. And so this is um, some parameter that we will use. And um, now let's see how we can already use this parameter. So um, as I said, so suppose somehow, um, and this is not quite true, so here I'm lying, but uh, let's pretend for this talk to make things easy that for every, so I have some fixed point set with a fixed coloring and suppose for every K, um, I can find a canonical K configuration on this point set. So like for every K, you give me some K, I can give you some method of uh, subdividing this point set into K chunks in some way. And uh, this is just somehow algorithmically defined. Suppose I can do this. And um, so let's say I define um, for this given point set for every K, some canonical K configuration that I call gamma K. And now I study these K configurations and I will use these K configurations to find my long alternating path. But I'm not telling you how I do that. I just say that, that I can do it somehow. Um, okay. And now the first observation is, um, so suppose, um, I mean, let's, let's see uh, if, uh, so with the stuff that we already know, um, this is already the first technical statement. So suppose um, I have, um, I look at uh, the uh, uh, configuration for 1000. So let's say and 1000 is just some arbitrary number. And let's assume that um, um, in my magic way of uh, finding these cave configurations, I find out that um, the um, 1000 configuration that I defined, it has a large index, namely index 0.1. What does this mean? So this means, um, so n is large compared to 1000. This means I have many, many chunks, right? So the chunks, they are quite small compared to the point set. So the chunks, they have length maybe a thousand and I have many of those chunks and the index of the configuration is 0.1. This means also, so I have many, many chunks. The chunks are, um, are short compared to N. And, um, and the average index of these chunks is noticeable. It's 0.1. That means that uh, in many of these chunks, I will have red points and blue points, right? I have many, many chunks. And in many chunks, I will have red points and blue points. And uh, if I'm in this situation, I'm lucky because then I, I know that I will have many runs, right? So um, the colors have to alternate often. Right, um, so I have many, many chunks, and then many in, 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 in a substantial fraction of the chunks by Markov inequality, I will have um, often uh, red points and blue points, and this means also that red and blue has to alternate a lot. Um, this means I have a lot of uh, runs, and then I can use this result um, that I noted that I mentioned earlier 
that um, if you have many runs, you will have a long alternating path, right? So if, uh, and I mean, of course, you can play with the numbers to get the right thing, but this is somehow uh, as a proof of concept. So um, that how these um, uh, how these notions are interesting, right? This is the first uh, observation. And then the second uh, observation is uh, now um, conversely, if I look at a large um, K, this means somehow I have very few chunks, right? So I take maybe N over a thousand chunks. Um, so this means uh, I will have maybe a, only a constant number of chunks in which I um, subdivide my point set. And if I have something, uh, this configuration, and this uh, configuration has small index, that means I have a few chunks, maybe a, a thousand or two thousand chunks. And um, most of those chunks, they are quite uniform. They have one color is um, very strongly in the majority. Then also we can show that a long alternating path exists. And so this uh, requires some argument, but the intuition is somehow quite um, easy because you know that um, if you have like a very long chunk, so you have some chunk of maybe n over 1,000 points or something like this. So you have n over, so you have some segment of something like n over 1,000 points, and you know that basically um, you have n over 1,000 red points and only um, much much uh, less blue points, uh, um, a much smaller number of blue points, maybe n over. 1 million blue points or um, well, it would be n over 10,000 blue points, something like this that you know. I mean, you have some segment where you have n over 1,000 red points and less than n over 10,000 blue points um, on the one side. Then you can do a game which is quite similar to this thing with the halving line that I said, that somehow um, somewhere else you can conclude somewhere else there has to be some segment where you will have um, maybe also n over 1,000 um, blue points and um, and few uh, and and few red points, and few red, something like this. You can conclude, right? So you have some segment where basically you have a lot more uh, red points than you would expect on average. Then you have to find another segment where you will have a lot more blue points than you would expect on average. And then you can use this to um, to um, find a long path because you can connect here um, um, quite uh, densely. And then there's some other, and then the rest you can connect uh, somehow. Um, using the same argument as before. But I mean, of course, this is not a proof. You really have to go through some um, long calculations, but this is somehow essentially the reason why you can also win in that situation, right? If you have um, a, um, a large K and a small index. Okay, this is the second observation. Um, yeah, so this uh, here, what I just wrote, and I mean, this is some argument that was already used by Kinfield, Pach, and Toth, and we just generalized it. Okay, and so what can we conclude from this? So from this, we can somehow conclude that we should focus on uh, configurations um, where um, somehow the the, um, the chunk number it's um, somehow between um, I mean it's not too small and not too large, and the index should be um, also small but noticeable. I mean so this somehow tells us that we can focus on uh, certain configurations. And here I wrote uh, 3k instead of k for technical reasons that may be um, clear later. So it's still mysterious why I write 3k here, but um, this I will explain a bit later. So, but this already tells us that we can focus on some certain range of uh, chunks and uh, so, uh, certain configurations that have certain properties that will be useful later. Okay, and um, so now um, I think um, let's let's make a small um, detour. So now we focus on this and um, on these special configurations that have these properties. So let's keep that in the back of our heads. And now let's look um, at uh, something else. Um, because um, actually now for these configurations, we do not really look at alternating paths, but we look at separated matchings, which will be te technically better. And so let me tell you what a separated matching is. A separated matching is very similar to an um, um, alternating path, but it's slightly different. So we have the same input, um, like n points uh, in convex position, red and blue. And um, so a separate matching is just a plain bichromatic matching. So we connect red points to blue points in a matching, and we could not cross any segments and separated. So that's a matching. And um, separated means that there exists one line which intersects all the segments of the matching. So this is a separated matching. But I, I would not be allowed to add, say, um, oh, uh, so I, I guess that's even, um, yeah, that's a separated matching. Um, um, but um, so um, I think I don't have an example of something that's not a separated matching. Um, so but I mean, the decisive property is that there is this line that um, intersects all the segments of the matching. And then what's obvious is if we have a separate matching with k edges, then we can make it into an alternating path with 2k points, because um, I can just um, 
connect consecutive uh, segments of the matching, the corresponding endpoints to a path. And this will give, give me an alternating path. And I need the separation condition to really make sure that this path will be um, well defined. Um, okay. And so, I mean, that shows us, um, so we show that if we have such a suitable configuration as I just described, we can always find a separate matching which has uh, strictly more than one half edges, one half plus epsilon n edges. And this will somehow help us then, and then this immediately will tell us that we can find also a long alternating path. So, but now we work with the matchings because it will be technically easier. And um, so now ex let me explain to you how we find these matchings. And so now here I'm getting a bit more uh, foggy in my arguments, but I hope that I can give you some intuition of what's true. So now I somehow need to tell you how I can go from this configuration. So now let's go back to the configuration. So we have partitioned our point set into chunks. And um, now I want to show you how I can derive a separated matching from a configuration. And for this, I uh, have the notion of a chunk matching. So we recall that the configuration is a partition of the point set into chunks. And um, now I can define a chunk matching and this works as follows. I pick a, a halving line a line which somehow separates the chunks evenly so that I have the same number of chunks on both sides. And then I have some obvious way of um, doing a matching on this chunk level. So this would be um, a chunk matching. I pick this green halving line and then I match uh, these two chunks and those two chunks in the obvious way. Or I can pick another halving line, maybe this one. So this halving line, it um, actually goes through chunks. And then I, I match uh, these two chunks and this chunk is matched to itself and that chunk is also matched to itself. That's also possible. And then the next um, situation would be this one, um, another halving line, and then I would match these two chunks, the next example and so on, right? So this is how I can define a matching on the chunks of a configuration in a plain way. And um, then um, also I can define a notion of a random chunk matching um, where I can just pick this, um, uh, um, I mean, I showed you several ways of defining these chunk matchings and the random chunk matching is just one where I picked this uh, halving line uniformly at random. And um, now what I can tell you is that if I have a chunk matching, I can derive from this a separated matching. I have a matching at the level of the chunks and from that matching at the level of the chunks, I can go to a matching at the level of the points. And this is just a, an easy uh, way. So I just have to look at all the pairs of chunks that are matched and I, I will derive um, um, uh, matchings between the points in the chunks. So for example, if I uh, match a red chunk with a blue chunk, then um, I can derive, the, then I can match the points by just, um, if I have a red chunk, um, I know I have, um, so for 3K, I have um, a certain number of red points here and I have the same number of blue points on the other side and I can just match them from uh, like um, in a greedy way. And in this way, I can derive as many um, edges as I have uh, red or blue points in the chunks, right? So that's one way if I match, if my chunk matching matches two chunks of different colors, then I just get as many edges uh, as um, this K gives me in my, um, in my configuration. On the other hand, if I match uh, two chunks of the same color, then it gets a bit difficult because uh, now um, here on one side, um, so if I match uh, two blue chunks, I have the same number of blue points on both sides but uh, I don't really know how many red points I have. The only thing I know is that I have less red points than blue points. And uh, then I have two different ways of how I can match. I can match the red points here. I, I mean, I can match to the blue points there or I can match the, blue, uh, the, the red points over here to the blue points there. And um, there's two ways how I can do it. And I just pick the one which is better where I get more red points, right? So I mean, um, and so the number of matchings, uh, the, the number of matched edges is determined by the number of red points. I have two different ways how I can match. And I match in this way so that I get more edges. Yeah, and so the number of edges is the maximum of the red points that I have uh, on either side of this matching where I match two blue chunks with, with each other, right? So I get the maximum because I will have enough blue points. So there's always enough blue points there, but uh, uh, the bottleneck is the number of red points. And now there's some interesting fact. And the interesting fact is, so if I have some, um, if I have a, uh, uh, any configuration and I pick a random chunk matching. So, I mean, I, I define several ways of uh, how I can match these chunks and I pick one of them uniformly at random. Then in expectation, I will match at least N over two edges. Yes, so the matching will consist of N over two edges if I do that uniformly at random, right? So this is uh, an, the, uh, the important fact here. 
And so the proof is just a calculation. Unfortunately, I do not know a nice proof. So that would be a very nice challenge to somehow prove this um, in, in some easy argument that is not a long calculation. And um, so maybe the, the interesting facts, so why do I get this n over two? So the important thing is, um, so this um, proof, it just gives me a lower bound and decisively. So the bottleneck in the proof is somehow um, when I analyze um, the situation where I match two chunks of the same color. And in this situation, I need to estimate the number of edges that I have in my matching. And uh, uh, decisively uh, or uh, crucially, I use the bound that the maximum, that the number of matches that I get, uh, I do not use the maximum for computing this expectation, but I use the average, right? Because, um, and, um, and then if, if you use the, uh, if you do not count um, here in this matching the maximum of the, two, of the two numbers, but the average, then you get exactly N over two. Right, and, uh, and uh, in the worst case, this is uh, the best that you can have, right? Because um, if everything is uniform, then you get um, the, um, you, you, you will just uh, get um, uh, basically this bound for the maximum and then you get exactly N over two for a random chunk matching. And, but this is, uh, but there's some slack and you can exploit this. And now this is somehow the, the, what, it, what we use in our proof. And um, so now let me just uh, quickly sketch you now how we proceed. So. So we have this um, situation. So we have our good uh, configuration with this uh, in no, uh, which uh, for some k, which is not too small or not too big, and which has some noticeable index. And we pick a random chunk matching there. And then the first observation is: so we have we know the index of the whole configuration, but we do not know how the um, indices are distributed over the chunks. And if we know somehow that the indices over the chunks are not separated uniformly, so it happens somehow that there are many chunks whose index is much larger than 0.1 and also necessarily many chunks whose index is much smaller than 0.1, which can happen, right? Because it's just an average. But then we gain in this random chunk matching because then it happens if we match many chunks um, where uh, the indices are different, then um, this, uh, this estimation that we had, that we, um, that we um, bound, that we estimate the um, average, uh, the, the maximum by the average, this will be not tight and then we gain. Right, so this is the first situation, right? So we look at this configuration and when we look at the distribution of the indices in this configuration, and if this has some large variance, so if I like the indices deviate from the median, from, from the mean, then we gain because this is what our calculation shows that um, basically um, I, we will have a good situation in, um, in, um, um, in matching uh, chunks of the same color. And uh, so this means um, here we already win. And so this means we can somehow assume that um, the indices are all somehow close to the average, to the mean. Um, so we can assume that we have some special configuration. Now we learned more about our configuration. And now we continue. And so now um, the next uh, game is that we somehow uh, look uh, at the configuration that we get if, if we split every chunk into parts of three. And this is where I use that I have the small index 0.1 because now this tells me if I go from that I can somehow split every red k chunk, every red 3k chunk into three k chunks, and it will still be a k chunk, right? Because somehow I will have somehow three k red points, but too few blue points, so that I can somehow split every 3k chunk into k chunks. So somehow this small index tells me that I can somehow nicely split my configuration into smaller pieces, and I can play the same game. By subdividing um, the uh, by subdividing uh, each big chunk of three k, of in uh, with number three k into three smaller chunks with number k, and there I can play the same game. If again I have a large variance in this uh, sub configuration or refined configuration, I again win with the same argument. Or I know, or I do not win. But then I know that also in this refined configuration, the indices will be uniform. And now I need to come up with some new arguments. So somehow I know um, I'm in a situation for my k. Um, for my, uh, I have some um, 3k configuration where the chunks uh, have uniform indices. Basically, in every chunk, um, I have uh, the same uh, number of um, points of the minority color. And I have the same for the refined configuration. And now um, somehow I know that um, basically, if I um, look at the big red chunks, I match two of them, then it doesn't look like this, right? Um, so it's not really this worst case that somehow we have all the red points and all the blue points, but it's somehow more, um, more distributed. Um, I know that basically every big chunk, it falls into, it, it, it can be partitioned into 
um, uh, three smaller chunks where also the blue points are um, somehow uh, distributed more uniformly. And this means somehow I can, um, I can have some better matching where I can somehow not just use the blue points on one side, but I can use the blue points on both sides. And uh, in particular, um, somehow I can, um, I can um, use, um, yeah, so how, how do I say it? Um, I, can, I can use, uh, in addition to the points on this side, I can um, use some points on the other side. Right, and so approximately, so we can say maybe we gain one third of blue points more, right? I mean, but this of course is a very rough picture, right? And but I mean, it seems be, now I know that some of the colors have to be um, more dis more uniformly distributed, and then I can gain in the other direction, and that's it. I mean, that's basically the argument. I mean, that's all how I wanted to sketch it in the cartoon version, but then of course you have to quantify all of this. You have to. Um, calculate with these averages, you have to go from these bounds for the average to uh, quantify. I mean, I said, oh, um, I mean, if everything is close to the average, then uh, everything will be uniform. But of course, uh, this is not really a quantitative statement. So you have to somehow say, what does it mean to be close to the average? What does it mean to be close to uniform? And so on and so forth. And then there's a, long, a lot of calculations that make it quite messy. But at least this is the, um, this is, uh, the result that we get. And this is somewhat the main trick that we use. Yeah, and um, so let me try to conclude. So um, as I said, so the whole, the details, I, I mean, I think um, I think that the main ideas you can um, explain with a few pictures, um, but to really talk about the details, it gets very technical. Then um, the epsilon that we have is very small. Um, uh, it may be, if you look at the arguments um, uh, very closely, you can refine the numbers. We did not really try to do that, but it's quite small. Um, and um, so we still don't know what the right bound is um, for, uh, and um, I mean, it's more open than ever. We don't know um, the leading co constant is not one, the leading constant is not four thirds. So what should it be? We don't know. And also some of what's bothering me, so there should be somehow some simple proof for this. I mean, it always feels to me that uh, somebody who has some idea of Fourier analysis or something like that could give some very quick and easy proof of this uh, uh, result. But, um, I, I didn't, uh, I, I don't know enough to, to, to use that. Um, okay, so maybe that's all I wanted to say. Um, if anybody else wants to ask a question. I, of Thank you I'm very happy. much. Uh, Thank you. Bogdan, uh, questions? Yeah, I, I had like a stupid question. A presentation okay. specific. If you go back to slide 28. Yeah. Just two more. Yeah. This one, right? No, the next one, this one. So I feel like that drawing, the next one, sorry. This one? No, the one before, the one with the big red, the two chunks next to each other. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact that these are both 3K chunks means that the red parts should be equal, right? Uh, yeah, that's true. Okay. Yes, sorry. So I just yes, want yes, yes. I understood it, right? That's, that's correct. Yes, yes. And then it will be the same two slides later as well. Yes, 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 yes. Right? Sorry, okay. so that's just uh, No, it's yeah. fine. I thought I thought those were very nice though that they showed the point very well. Yes, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, of course, I mean, I guess I mean what I wanted yeah. to say is uh, it's supposed to show the fraction, right? So I mean, um it's, it's supposed to say I, I guess I should have drawn the the I mean, I, I drew them, these things the same size, but the, the red part should be equal and then the blue part should be of different sizes. So the size of the chunk should be different. Because right. I mean, so... size, exactly. Cool, thank you. <laughs> yes. More questions? Um, I have additional very stupid question, but uh, <laughs> why the minimum weighted matching doesn't give you um, separated matching of size n? So the minimum weight matching, um, so you mean, so how can there not be always a separated matching, matching of size n? I guess that's the question that you have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and if you use the minimum weight, um, matching, you, you well, get matching of size n, no? Yes, but I mean, you have the separation condition. I mean, it's correct. Uh, so um, what you're saying is, um, so there always exists a, a, a bipartite matching, a bichromatic matching that is non-crossing um, that is perfect. That is true. But I have this additional condition of um, the matching being um, 
being uh, separated. And separated means there has to be this line that intersects all the segments of the matching. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what makes it difficult. So, the, um, so you're right that there will always be, um, if you, if you um, drop this separated condition, there will always be a perfect matching that is non-crossing and bichromatic. But the separation condition makes it hard. And um, so there the same bounds apply. And I mean, you can also look at this um, example by Erdosch that I had um, earlier. Like this, this configuration tells you if you have the separation condition, um, let's see, um, if you have the separation condition, then also you cannot find more than um, three quarter n edges. Uh, also for this example. And um, I think, um, or uh, in, in, in other words, so if you look at this example, you can argue if you have more than three quarter n edges, maybe three quarter n plus four, or maybe I, I'm not sure about the constant. If you have more than three quarter n edges, there have to be three edges that are not stabbed by the same line. This mm -hmm. you can also argue quite quickly. I mean, um, because if you have more than three quarter n edges, you have to have like some edge down here and um, I guess uh, two edges up here, one edge that goes here and one edge that goes there, and then already you lost. I think that's that's somehow the argument also. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. More questions? Uh, I have a question. Hi. Uh, concerning the lower bound of the Erdős, the n lower bound using a having a line. Yes. So this is based on the convexity, right? That you can. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so what if the points are not in convex position? So you just want, you're looking for a, a maximum length path. A yeah, I have no idea. I mean, okay. so this, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, so um, so the, the underlying question, so this is already a toy version of a more general question. And the more general question is that you have um, any point set and, um, that is uh, not in convex position and you want to find a, um, a longest path that alternates between um, the red and blue points and that is non-crossing. And uh, so there, I, 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 have, I have no idea about this problem. So I'm not sure what the best lower bound is. Um, and I don't know if it's NP hard um, or if it's algorithmically easy. Um, so um, I don't know. And I think it's not known whether it's NP hard, but um, don't quote me on that. Um, but this is, I think this is a, a problem that you really want to solve. And for this, this is like some, some toy problem, um, but I'm not sure um, if there's anything known about finding um, like a longest uh, non-crossing path that is alternating. Um, maybe you can get find, maybe you can find some root n bound, um, but I'm not sure if you can find an n bound, which is alternating, I'm not sure. I would expect that you can get some root n because there will be by other stacker dash or something like that, uh, or log n, or I, I don't know. No, I don't know. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, if there are no more questions, let me thank uh, Wolfgang again and advertise the talk for next week. Uh, so we will have a couple of talks in the seminar on. Uh, sorry, this is not next week. One moment. Next week is a talk by Irina Kosicina from P. Eindhoven on multi robot motion planning for unit disks. It's one of a couple of talks in the seminar this semester on multi robot motion planning. Uh, have a good week, stay safe, and see you next week hopefully yeah thank you okay thank you wolfgang wolfgang can you stay a minute on sure